Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Astartes Anonymous podcast. Today, Red and I are bringing you a really fun episode about Space Marine successor chapters, featuring the incredible The Gaming Storyteller, aka The Dutch 40k Guy, aka Alex. So, without further ado, I am once again trapped in a room with a real-life serial killer and a Dutchman with an unhealthy obsession with Space Marine thighs. I'm your host, Tom, and these are my co-hosts. Hello, I'm Red, and how did you know I'm Dutch? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm the Gaming Storyteller, also known as Alex, a fellow 40k YouTuber, and I'm genuinely super excited to be here with you guys. Oh, we're, oh well, we're really excited to we're really excited to have you. We've actually, for the audience, we've been sat getting to know... I mean, Alex and I have been speaking in a Discord on and off for the last week or two, maybe even three, Yeah. Uh, randomly. It's a really lovely Discord that's actually run by uh, Chrono the Harlequin. He's got a YouTube channel. He's he's really great. Really, really great. The uh, Was it Live from the Black Library? Is that his channel name? Yeah, that's his channel name. He's a great guy. He also has a meme channel, which is incredibly funny. I think it's called Chrono the Harlequin. It's amazing. I don't know. He talks shit about Night Lords a lot, so uh, <laughs> he better sleep with his fucking eyes open, I tell you that. <laughs> Uh, I, I actually promised Chrono we'd we'd have him on uh, soon, and I completely forgot about that until like literally ten minutes ago. I'm like, well, we've oh, already no. got Alex here, so maybe next time, maybe oh. next time. <laughs> For this uh, week's models of the week, we have uh, two very great submissions. Yep, we have one done by Lord IKEA, which is a IKEA Kriegsman, <laughs> which is really I, interesting uh, because we actually thought. For a second, we were like, "Oh, we'll just chuck this in here because it's it's some very blatant like Ukraine support." No, it's <laughs> it's an IKEA Kriegsman. It's a meatball yeah, Kriegsman. Right. <laughs> it's just a meatballs. The sweet the Swedish and the Ukrainian flags are too close. We need we need to start separate not separating their <laughs> colors. Oh my god! Oh my god. <laughs> red segregation. No, no red. Stop. Anyway, yeah, I thought it was fun because I like really bright contrasting colors. Plus the yellow on it's really smooth and mm. uh, the folds are highlighted very nicely. I mean, you know me, I'm a huge fan of snowy bases, so seeing a bunch of these, like, side by side would be so fucking cool. I really like his book. I think his book is awesome. The fact yeah. that he scribbled in the little lines and just, like, chanting, like, some religious text while charging into the enemy, pointing his Kriegsman forward. Absolutely. It looks that's amazing. Not, that's not religious text. That's the IKEA field manual. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. That's the catalog of all of the like Horf and Borfin uh, furniture things you get at the store. The Horf and Borfin, the meatballs. Yeah, it's just the entire IKEA catalog. <laughs> Since Moots isn't here, we have to uh, really ramp up the Swedish uh, slander. Oh, sorry, Moots, we love you, but you're not here to defend yourself. So uh, this is what you get. Don't love me in that category. Uh, and then next up, we have uh, a really, a uh, really fucking awesome uh, Eldar Warlock by Mumu. And actually, Alex actually picked this one from Models of the Week. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I genuinely just play, picked it because of the color theory that goes here. For those that don't know, I did commission painting for almost a decade. So seeing like genuinely good color theory in models makes me so excited. Just the purple together with the green is an amazing combination. They are very complementary colors. Then with the white like face mask and the weapon and the back piece and then the staff itself as well with some really cool like non-metallic mats on there. I love it. I'm actually going to use this opportunity to like plug. I don't know if you do commissions anymore, but I'm I, Alex showed us his fucking commission town art about an hour ago and it blew me the fuck away. I'm putting those on the screen right now. You got to have a look at this. It's actually insane. They're they're really Fucking great! That you did commission arts for like ten years before this, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, insane. I would have never yeah. guessed. <laughs> I painted for competition for as while for a while as well. I painted for Stiff Neck Studios in America. Holy Came over shit. to Nova Open. We raised sixty thousand dollars painting a fuck? Warlord Titan and like a Death Watch army. And um, then we, I was part of the Capital Palace and won a gold in Monsters, which I'll send you a picture for later. Have you That's won a golden demon yet? I've got three. You have really? three golden demons? Are you joking? Uh, I have holy a, fuck have two silvers and a gold. Why the fuck? Why the huh? fuck How are, are we you only doing just hearing like, about this now? 
Yeah, why, why are you doing, like, successor chapter shorts? I'm a hobbyist. I, I like painting in my free time. Ladies Holy and gentlemen, uh, new introduction. We have a three-time award-winning Golden Demon artist here with us today. <laughs> yeah, like, Tom is making the intro, and Alex is like, oh, like, just say, like, I'm the Dutch, or, like, uh, like... I'm gaming storyteller because I had a gaming channel, but completely left out the part that yeah. he fucking is a three-time Golden Demon Award-winning champion. Shit. What the fuck? Oh, bro, what? Seriously, how do we? What the fuck? Yeah, well, it's just I I love painting miniatures, but doing it as a job for so long, it's kind of almost traumatized me for painting miniatures for like competition and things. Now, when I paint, it's just fun armies to like play 10th edition with, which has honestly been really fun. And of course, I play Blood Ravens because I'm a Dawn of War nerd. Yep. And <laughs> it's like, for now, I just paint for that. Maybe in the future, I might end up making some tutorials or videos Holy on shit. miniatures themselves. Ladies Jesus, and gentlemen, we're all a hacks. man of many talents. Holy fuck. I love 40k, what can I say? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, so, such a humble man, too. <laughs> I completely lost track of what we were originally talking about. Anyway, segmenting into the next section, I want to shout yeah. out a couple, a couple people on our Discord server who, again, By all means. By all means. Who again have made uh, specifically me stuff. One is that we have uh, Aaron, or, or rather known as Ernie Snow. I think that's how you say, you're supposed to say that. I, I, just, uh, I, just, I just say Aaron is Aaron. Yeah, Aaron is Aaron. Aaron also has like a um, a link to uh, Tom will put the link down to Aaron's social media stuff. Yep, they're a really like uh, really fun artist who has like a very cartoony style. And anyway, they made me this. I fucking love soup. After I lost my fucking mind playing a game once. <laughs> <laughs> the Discord chats in the Astartes Anonymous Discord server are they get a bit wild, ladies and gentlemen. They get a bit. It's bit mainly wild. just me screaming, but that's beside yep. the point. Uh, and uh, they also made this one of Talos, as all artists should in the Discord. It's crazy. How many weeks in a row now have we featured fucking Talos fan art? This is insane. And it will never stop. You come <laughs> if you're an artist and you come into our Discord, you are contractually obligated to make a Talos. I will have it no other way. <laughs> you won't He's get paid. Cool like character. it's just it's just part of the gig. We're really sorry. I mean, Red's not sorry. You get paid in living another day. <laughs> That's Night the Lord, deal, and gentlemen. That's the and I'm not I'm not going to alter the deal at all, and the second one or the, actually the third one is this cracked out oh, one this fucking cursed hotline Miami fucking thing. Oh, I the hotline that. Talos <laughs> click clack and the twelve gauge shotgun done by uh, Von Cadai again in our Discord. God, that's so good. It's the so intense, fucking cursed, bro. The intense stare of murderous intent is borderlining on gleeful. No toss, only murder. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> I love it so much. It's it's unironically somehow, despite being a pure fucking meme, it's somehow the most Night Lord thing I've ever seen. Like, yeah, you're gonna understand true fear just by in the mere presence of this. Yeah, holy shit. And then finally, I want to give a shout out to our friend Steph, who is yes. currently working on a big project uh, of hers, where she is doing these Legion-specific logos... Uh, such as the one Tom's going to put on the screen. I have Dominus yep. Knox. And, it's uh, amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll actually see put up can... the other ones as well. I'll go chase Steph for the other ones. Some of the stuff that Steph's made is really great. She's got such a unique sort of art style. Uh, we'll post her socials in the description below. Seriously recommend. It's really great stuff. Yeah, and her, her plan is to make all these specific Legion logos that are supposed to be like just kind of fun to have into uh yeah into stickers that people can purchase in the near future they're not out yet but they are they are in uh in the works and she's currently working on that so if you're interested in following that and maybe getting some for yourself uh go check out her social media links that i'm going to force tom to put down there no it's it's absolutely fine steph is steph's really amazing steph's been a long time regular in our discord for a good uh, yeah, she is the server mom. She is really exceptional. Have a look at her stuff. If you like it, send her a message. Uh, can't can't rate her highly enough. Yeah. She also does commissions. If anyone wants commission, check that out too. Yeah. Right, gentlemen. Should we have a look at our main segment for today? Oh, I will not yes, allow sir. you. You will die before you get a second chance. <laughs> 
I'm scared. So we wanted to do a fun segment today where we just had a flap about our favorite successor chapters. So second founding onwards, our favorite success successor chapters of the Adeptus Astartes. Uh, and so I will, for the moment, I will give the floor to the successor chapter god of Europe, the gaming storyteller, a.k.a. Alex. Please, take the floor, Alex. All right. So up till this point, uh, I've always kind of been the Ultimate Celestial Lions fan. But until today, that completely changed when I went into the Exorcist. The Exorcist are by far the most out-of-pocket amazing chapter ever. They are rumored to have the Gene Seed from the Grey Knights, but it is said that they have Gene Seed from the Imperial Fist. I already freaking love that. They start their training as any other chapter, you know, horrendous casualty race, uh, casualty rates with the hundreds of people dying for just Sorry. one Marine to emerge. Sorry, aren't these the fucking chapter that fucking... uh possess their fucking neophytes I oh, we'll get they there. actually do anything oh we'll get there oh, okay. so as they proceed and they get implanted with their gene seed towards the end the last thing they need to do become, to become a full brother um, they go through what you said is a possession they will allow a demon into their soul to take them over for 12 Terran hours straight where they will fight and try to survive the demon. And after those 12 hours, an Ordo Malleus Inquisitor comes by and kind of just Expelleriamus is like out of existence <laughs> back into well, the warp. I, I thought, no, I thought it was they, they themselves have to expel it out. No, they have to survive it. Well, be, okay, because I, I heard that it was a test of willpower that they can expel the demon themselves and those who fail get locked up in like this shadow prison underneath their planet. Imagine that you go 12 hours 12 hours. Imagine you go six hours and you manage to get the fucking demon out of you yourself. And some poor motherfucker comes along and just puts another demon inside of you. You've got another six hours, bitch. Deal <laughs> with, with it. a different spicy demon inside of you. No, so I originally told us <laughs> it 12. It says which... 12 hours on the wall, asshole. Stop trying to be a go-getter. <laughs> <laughs> so I originally told as well that it would be like put in and then they would have to take it out themselves. No, they just endure it and then gets expelled out after that. The chapter master, though, is where this originally came from, was just a normal guy that went up against a changer of ways, the full Tsinjian greater demon, got fully possessed by it, and then managed to push it out himself. Which what the fuck? That should not be a thing. Sorry, but the a, fact a great, that he did, did you say a greater demon? A greater demon. What the fuck? Yeah. I thought I thought that, that yeah, that's I think there's a little bit of lore on him that all I know is that he passed the Rubicon Primaris and wears Gravis armor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. So he uh, another thing I heard about the accessor chapter is, is when they get the demon expelled out of them, two things happen. The exorcist they get, chapter. Yeah, the exorcist chapter. What did I say? I think you said the, the successor chapter. Either way. Um <laughs> they get uh they get like these black runes on their body and they become immune to demon possession after that. Yeah, they also become invisible to demons and psychers. What? Yeah. Yeah. Their warp well, it, signature, like, leaves for a bit. Only very powerful psychers will, like, see them. Alex, is there no, like, collab stories between the exorcists and the um, the Grey Knights? Like, holy fuck. There actually it, is. <laughs> just, like, from this, like, basic understanding, it almost sounds like the, uh, you know, that fucking uh, the Suicide Squad meme. <laughs> where it's like, oh, I do what he does, but better. That's kind of how we're describing the exorcist right now. Yeah, so they to test out the new technique of possessing marines and seeing if it was actually effective, they sent down two companies to a planet to like try to wipe it from the demons. It was a highly demonic planet with a lot of corn demons and singe demons. They were fighting a bunch, and they managed a KDR, a kill-to-death ratio, of 97 demons per marine. Which what is the fuck? insane. That's so dumb. I made a short like a like less than a week ago. I mean, when this video goes live, it'll be like three and a half weeks ago. I made a short like a week ago on Castellan Crow talking about his... Uh, I, I opened it with how he's killed more demons than almost any Marine, save a couple. I now feel kind of stupid. I now feel kind of stupid in, in, in wake of that information. They did end up all dying, but there was a uh, squad of Grey Knights waiting with the Inquisitor in orbit. Because if they would turn, if they would fall to the Chaos Possession, 
they would be able to wipe them out. But instead of falling to chaos, they just died by themselves. But it was highly effective. Holy shit. Oh my I fucking love them. They look Why great as well. Why don't we do that more? Yeah. yeah, they have like the, they have like a nice um, word bearer's red almost. Yeah, I've noticed that. I've no, I and the really chapter love... symbol is actually close to like the heresy era of word bearers as well. It is, yeah. I really love the aesthetic for the Exorcist. I, I must admit, I don't know an awful lot about the Exorcist, but their color scheme is one that I really like because of that exact reason that it kind of harkens back to the, um, the post monarchia desolation word bearers. Yeah. That's and so no, the cool. word the word bearers changed their armor to red after Monarchia. No, that's what I mean. The post post Monarchia. Oh, post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, as well, with all these, like, with them going through the training of expelling a demon or at least experiencing a demon, a lot of them also awaken their psychic powers, bringing them even more in line with the Grey Knights. <laughs> Holy shit! Most of them are like at least like psychically capable. Maybe not no, fully psychers, but close. That's weird because not weird, but it's kind of it's interesting that um, in her there's a heresy novel, the Magnus the Red Book, called The Crimson King. There is um, a mortal, a human that got possessed by a greater shard of Magnus when his soul fractured, and he got possessed by him and started doing all this crazy shit. But then eventually, that that shard of Magnus got expelled out of him by Armorman. And after that, that inqu that guy went on to, to found the Inquisition, and he was also incapable of being possessed ever again. Because the Space Wolves said that once you get, get expel a demon out of your body, they can't possess you again because you're like burned off from the warp. Yeah, that's fucking that's crazy. the only other recorded instance of that. And there's an entire chapter that does this. <laughs> yeah, they've weaponized it. I'm I'm so sorry, gentlemen. I my fucking bladder is full. Just keep going without me. I'm just going to take a piss. BRP. <laughs> Yeah, it's just the... I really just like the basic idea of them, but they do kind of step on the line of being Grey Knights a little bit too much here and there in the lore. But at the same time, they do have a much lower KDR than what a Grey Knight would have. Grey Knight could probably push off like 500 to 600, and an Exorcist only around 100 on a lucky day. I mean, I don't know. I like the, I like the Exorcists more than the Grey Knights because... It's the idea that they are just a marine chapter that found basically a loophole. Yeah. With dealing with the warp, they're not. They're, they're just marines, and I mean marines are still powerful as shit. But like, it makes them feel more like a specialized marine chapter, unlike the Grey Knights, who just feel like Mary Sue's almost. Yeah. Like every story of the Grey Knights, it's always like, oh fuck, it's the Grey Knights, we're gonna win. Like in the Dark Imperium novels. Typhus, the first captain of the Death Guard, was fucking up a bunch of Ultramarines, and he was only stopped because a singular Grey Knight showed up. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, like, it, it's cool, it depends on how you write them, but the idea that Grey Knights are more of a plot device than anything else, where the Exorcists actually have that, you know, weaponized uh, loophole against the warp. Weaponized exorcisms. It's great. Ex weaponized exorcism. Plus the plus the name the exorcists is fucking cool. Yeah. I'm back. Yeah, it's probably one of the one of the coolest uh Probably one of the coolest successor chapters I and know And they're about. really not that well known because, of course, doing these kind of techniques in their recruitment and, like, in their training, uh, they are not really around in the Imperium much. They are very secretive about it because most, like, um, most normal Inquisitors would absolutely destroy them if they even found yeah. out, like, the sliver of heresy they're committing. But isn't that, isn't that kind of part of their gig, though? They are sanctioned by the, by the Ordo Malleus to do this, you know, this degree of shenanigans. Yeah, it would definitely start like a, well, it would be like a 15th Inquisitor war, where there's just a bunch I mean, of Inquisitors warring about it. And also on top of it, Inquisitors can't actually do anything to Marines without consent from the the High Lords of Terra. Yeah. Like, I, I, there's, a, there's, there, there's this idea that Inquisitors have ultimate power in the Imperium. Like, no, they can investigate a chapter if they want, but they can't actually do shit to them without, you know, going to dad first. <laughs> we'll see the war between uh, the Grey Knight slash Ordo Malleus and the Space Wolves. You know, the Space Wolves basically said, no, fuck off. And they had no choice, but eventually, after a little bit, to, uh, to listen to that. Yeah, and like, even then, that was basically a singular group of Inquisitors doing all that. Like, they, yeah. they weren't, that was just by themselves. And they fucked up the Space Wolves, but the Space Wolves fucked them up in return. Yeah. <laughs> 
And most of that part also came from the... By the way, this is for anyone who wants to do the same thing to their chapter. The Space Wolves got away with it because they're basically an old legion. <laughs> yeah. Any other chapter that came from, like, in the Indominus founding would get fucking wiped out in a second. If but it not even tried that. The same any, shit. any, like, 20th founding onwards would have got blasted. Oh, yeah. Completely. Yeah. Right, let's no move doubt. on to another successor. I really, I'm so sorry, guys. We could talk, we could actually do a whole episode on the Exorcist. They have so much fucking shit. <laughs> Day deal. We're but not a judge as ridiculous, Tom. I know, I'm sorry, Red. I'm sorry. Well, maybe one day. But I really, really want to talk about the Sons of Medusa. Now, the Sons of Medusa are really funky because they are one of the only chapters that wasn't actually founded during a founding. They were founded by uh, an imperial edict which is a fancy way of saying they were founded singularly out of necessity. These motherfuckers uh, basically a result were a result of a fucking civil war amongst the Adeptus Mechanicus uh, and were actually founded because the Iron Hands and their successors just, just didn't know what the fuck to do with their marines, the individuals who were caught up in the sort of doings of this civil war. Basically, in M36 or M37, something called the Morai Schism happened, where essentially the Adeptus Mechanicus went to war with itself because a number of... Ind uh, this, is a, uh, this is all paraphrasing. This is nowhere near the full thing. I, I really recommend reading up on it. But the Adeptus Mechanicus went to war with itself because... Uh, a portion of the Adeptus Mechanicus felt as though... Sorry, scratch that. I'm going to yeet this last 30 seconds. <clears throat> a, a, a portion of the Adeptus Mechanicus went to war with itself because a subsection of the Adeptus Mechanicus, starting from the... I think it was called the Morai, the Morai or the Morai Forge World, began to receive what they interpreted as messages from the, the, uh, the Astronomicon uh, basically foretelling future events. And one of those events was that the Ecclesiarchy and the Adeptus Mechanicus would one day eventually be formed into one singular entity. And when the Adeptus Mechanicus at large heard about this, they fucking hated it. They were not fucking happy at all. And so what they did was they basically said, hey, listen, anyone of you who believes in the Morai Creed, you need to fucking die right now. And so whilst the Mechanicus had its war with itself to exterminate the Morai Creed, the Space Marines of the Adeptus Astartes, aka the Iron Hands, and their successors who believed in the Morai Creed, were basically in a really fickle position where they had to say to themselves, hey motherfuckers, if you believe in this, you need to get the fuck out right now. And so the Iron Hands and their successors basically signed a treaty saying, hey listen, if you agree with the Morai Creed, we will not kill you under the sole uh, exclusion that you leave the fucking chapter and fuck off right now. And so all of the Iron Hands and their successors who believed in the Morai Creed basically banded together and by imperial edict formed the Sons of Medusa. However, for you Iron Hands uh, aficionados out there, there was one exception to this, and that is the Red Talons. The fucking Red Talons, were they so the Red Talons were basically... Um, they were a second founding Iron Hands chapter, I believe, and they were a little bit different from the usual Iron Hands successes in the sense that they were brutal as fuck. We're talking flesh terrors, Marines malevolent. The Red Talons were brutal as fuck, and any Space Marines within the, Mer the Red Talons who believed in the Morai Creed, these motherfuckers were just killed. They were just fucking killed, like outright. Anyways, love that. Yeah, absolutely. It should be noted that the Morai Creed wasn't just that Mechanicus Ecclesiarchy thing. It was a bunch of other stuff that was coming true, which yes. is what really scared the shit out of them. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The Mechanicus was like, holy shit, what the fuck is this? But uh, the, the Sons of Medusa have, until then and to this day, remained one of my favorite successor chapters. They were actually present at the Badab War, or the Badab Wars, uh, and they... They came in at the same sort of time, I believe, I could be wrong on this, but I believe they came in at the same sort of time as the utterly insane Minotaurs and the Karcharidons, the Space Sharks, and basically used a fuck ton of terror tactics to fuck up the Astral Claws and Lufthuron during my favorite, that war. My favorite part about the Sons of Medusa is that they go and steal other chapters' stuff. Yeah. There's, there's literally a little bit of lore which talks about the Sons of Medusa turning up to the Badab War. 
and mm-hmm. literally not engaging in any purposeful fighting, but literally just turning up to steal unknown technology <laughs> and then fucking off again. You know, yeah, like, it's really like ch- other chapters, dreadnoughts, their armor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the last last gun you have there. It's mine now. Yeah, yeah. literally. <laughs> it's not like the uh, Sons of Medusa are underpowered where they need to do that. They just no, want to do right. it. Yeah, <laughs> just to be a jerk. <laughs> oh, I uh, love the Sons of Medusa. You actually, Tom actually painted an army of Sons of Medusa. I do. I'll post a quick picture on now. Yeah, he did a great job. He's probably one of the few people that's done Sons of Medusa in a very vibrant scheme. And like I said before, I really like vibrant color schemes. And it's really it's 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 really cool to see like a canon chapter get that type of treatment because normally when you do canon, you want to make it gritty and dark. But Tom made it like very bright, vibrant, but still in line with Sons of Medusa. They also have a uh, a really cool Legends model, which I don't remember his name, but he's supposed to be really chunky. Tech Marine with a Thunder Hammer. Oh, fuck. Oh, I was going to bug me. I'm, I'm so sorry to the audience because I should know this, but I don't. I should know his name, but I don't. Oh, it's Tom will flash just... the name on the screen right now. I'll put a picture of him on the screen now if I can find well, there's it. No, there's no actual model of him. He's a Legends model. You have to make him yeah. yourself. Oh, man. I miss that about old editions of Warhammer where they would just give you a data sheet and basically say, hey, it's up to you to make the model. Have fun. It yeah. sounds like an asshole thing to do, but it's actually brilliant. That's actually so brilliant. It, the the encouragement of GW, a long lost thing, GW encouraging kit bashing. Holy shit! You know the amount of sets that like the honor guards for like or like the the captain squads and stuff like that. Just buying captains, buying older space marine sets, combining all those bits together, getting maybe like a uh, a. One of the, oh, fuck, what's his name? Vulcan, he's style models, for example, yeah. getting his spear. Stuff like that. I, I miss those days. Yeah. Lifetime ago. Lifetime ago. It's crazy to think, though, because I've been into this hobby for maybe half a decade on a push. Red's been into it, I think, about the same. But you've actually been here for over a decade, haven't you? I've been here for 15 years. And so you've seen this. Yeah, literally, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> And I've loved every second. Well, almost every second. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how did you feel when uh, a few weeks ago, when GW were like, hey, by the way, your uh, Leviathan and Contempt to Dreadnoughts are now legends? Oh, hey. Oh, it's, it's not even like those I'm like sad about, but it's all right because you can use them for the Horus Heresy game. But just oh, yeah. your little box knots. My little yeah. box knot is gone. My little boy His is name, gone forever. By the way, the name of that uh, Sons of Medusa guy is Veilun Cal. Oh, Valen Cal, yes! Oh, you're so right. Holy fuck. Oh, uh, it's so obvious now. Oh, and he so- has he has a Masterwork Plasma Cutter, a Flamer, a Masterwork Plasma Cutter, which is the oh, way he has two different profiles for his Plasma Cutter. He has a Medusian Hammer and a, thun- and a Servo Arm. See, I, d- I haven't looked at Valen Cal in 10th edition, but in 8th and 9th edition, Valen Cal had his own Legends data sheet. Wow. And what the I, ha- his his supercharged plasma cutter has a strength of an 8, a- AP minus 3. His plasma cutter was a fucking melter gun, boys. That, that's, just, <laughs> that's just a mini melter gun. It yeah. has a 12-inch range. <laughs> Holy shit, what the fuck? Wow. How much damage? Uh, it says strength, it's just a strength 8. Oh, damage three. Damage three. Ooh, like yeah. a, a Terminator killing machine. Holy fuck. Oh, holy yeah, man. what the hell? Pocket sounds, but it's a melter gun. <laughs> yeah, literally. His, 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 yeah, all of his weapons have a damage of a three. And his th- his thunder hammer has a strength times two. So are you looking is this ninth legends rules you're looking at? This is ninth legends rules because oh he's no longer God. in tenth. Oh, oh so fucking sad. What a murder machine. Yeah. Yeah, scary man. Come on, Red. Uh, tell us about uh, tell us about a successor chapter, Red. So one successor chapter I really like that I heard about um, is a successor chapter from a book called The World Engine, where the Imperium fights the Necrons, who are currently piloting a planet. Not a moon, not a Death Star, a fucking planet called The World Engine, that's powered by an, as- that's powered by an Ascendant Catan shard. The Imperium threw, like, four major fleets at this thing and weren't able to actually damage it. It was so fucking powerful, and it was just going through the universe rampaging. Anyway, all that came to an end when a chapter called the Astral Knights decided to do the most baller shit in the world and ram their battle barge straight into the heart of the world engine, <laughs> all deploy at the same time, and be- 
and the entire chapter deployed, killing everything they came into contact, blew up the main reactor, freed the Catan Shard, and destroyed the world engine with the, with the help of the Imperium bombarding it from orbit. At the end of it, the Astral Knights ended up um, losing almost all their numbers to where only like 30 or... Between 30 to 90 Marines were left. And as that was done, instead of giving them time to, you know, recuperate their losses, the Imperium just instead sent a different successor chapter to take their shit. And that was the end of the uh, Astral Knights, where they just took a ship and went to the universe, and no one knows what happens to them. But one of the things I like about them is that they have a lot of characterization uh, for them in that one novel, because they're one of the few successors that actually have their own novel. To start with, they're an iron, they're not iron hands, they're an Imperial Fist successor chapter. They have this color scheme of silver armor with blue metallic trim. Beautiful. And they have this big emphasis on personal honor and dueling to a point where if they think anything is the, the slightest little insult to them, they're like, all right, motherfucker, we're throwing down now. Uh, to the point where uh, they'll never actually engage in killing one another, but these feuds can actually extend to killing fellow battle brothers just over this. And the whole chapter is okay with it. Wow. They're they're really they, they are they're really like hard motherfuckers. They were super into their personal heraldry and uh, honor. They were willing to do whatever it takes to uphold that. They have this thing where on their planet there's these crystals, and new neophytes will go out through this field of crystals until they find one that sings to them and they have to whittle it down into a like a, a rock like a, a rock knife a crystal a crystal knife and that knife uh stays with them for their entire service and they fight these honor duels with these knives to the first who draws blood that's but, like they have wacky man uh, you actually almost said a moment ago you almost uh, misspoke and said iron hands instead of imperial fists this notion of these motherfuckers killing each other and the, 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 the general populace of the Battle Brothers being okay with it is such an Iron Hands thing. This idea that if you're not fucking strong enough to survive this duel, then your death is your own fucking fault. That is such an <laughs> Iron Hands thing to do. Yeah. Not good enough. When when they got decimated, their chapter master died, and there's the art piece of him is he's pretty fucking cool. He's this big dude holding an act, two axes. Oh man, you gotta post that in the thing. I gotta, I gotta put that on the screen. I'm gonna put that on the screen right behind me, assuming Red sends it to me. Holy shit! Yeah. The only uh, main thing I know about that story, which is like the little details that I love within 40k lore specifically, is that they blew up the reactors with just good old melta bombs. Not special weaponry. Not like a void nuke or anything like that. No, just melta bombs. <laughs> yeah, they, they were. Yeah, they were losing the battle, and they just said, "Fuck it, we ball." <laughs> and decided to like everything and anything is go ready to go. Fuck it. Fuck it, we all. That's the type of space marine stuff that I miss seeing. You know these yeah. heroic, last defiant like throwaways. I think that's one of the. the I mean, I don't want to bitch about Primaris because I genuinely like Primaris, but that's one of the things with the Primaris narratives that we haven't seen an awful lot of, where we saw that in abundance with Firstborn stories. This notion of space marines going kamikaze to defend the Imperium, or, or, you know, big or small scale, whereas Primaris feels a lot more neutered in, in regards to this kind of shit happening. It's also just it, that they die too it's, fast. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's honestly some Black Templar shit that they pulled. God, I fucking love the Black Templars. I tell you what, I'm gonna segue into that. I don't know an awful lot about the Black Templars, but they are the literally... The, aren't they the biggest successor chapter ever? Oh, yeah, by yes. far. But no one knows how many marines that they have. Oh, that's it. That's it. And you don't want to know. You don't want to know because the, uh, the the high lords and the inquisition will get a little bit upset if they found out. I imagine. Do you know so how I'm they got around it? Yeah, the Codex of Stardust is a loophole. You can have over a thousand marines as long as you're on a crusade. And yeah. Sigismund's like, <laughs> on a crusade, you say? <laughs> I fucking love Sigismund. Holy shit! Oh, I, I, so I'm pretty sure boy. everyone, I'm pretty sure everyone knows about Black Templars. Black Templars are my favorite successor chapter. Yeah. And um, you know they're the they're the Templars. They're the uh, religious fanatics that go around like crusading, and they're they're Warhammer. They're basically they the very. They're probably one of the few things everyone learns about when they get into oh, Warhammer. Yeah. Is the Black Templars because they have such a, a unique not yeah. It's a unique vibe it to is them unique. because yeah, it's the night. It's the night vibe turned up to eleven. Templar night vibe, 
Because yeah. there's a ton, there's a t- like a handful of chapters all called the Templars. But every time you think of Templars in Warhammer, you're going to think of the Black Templars. And it's it, not it, just that. They have the largest, uh, they, they do have the largest canon chapter. They're a second founding. They're founded by fucking Sigismund out of all people. Sigismund. But they also have like fantastic writing. I mean, yeah. Grimaldus, the Battle oh. of Hell's Reach. Yeah. They they had their characterization of you peas you all think like oh they're the the joke is that they're really angry and they're hyper violent and they cause a lot of civilian deaths which isn't even true that black templars are actually very human in a sense that they're fighting for humanity they're fighting yeah. for defending people they have a large emphasis on that their characters one of my favorite black templar things was in the the uh, dark Imperium novels, yeah, where there was a this guy that Gilliman basically hired to go uh, catalog the history of the Imperium, mm-hmm. yeah, and this guy has a Black Templar bodyguard, and this Black Templar bodyguard is of course a Black Templar, you know, and every conversation he has with this mortal, you think it'd be like something very like you know he's very like strict and disciplined and doesn't say much, but no, they have full on conversations with each other yeah. and they actually reminisce about the times that they had where this black templar had to defend this guy from fucking inquisitors and stuff. <laughs> and it, it's just it's it, it shows you the side of the black templars that, you know, a lot of people don't see is that they are in in themselves very human and willing to, you know, uh have these dialogues with people. You know, my favorite scene from that book is the 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 chronological got sick from a disease from Nurgle, yeah. and he was in a hospital bed, and he woke up, and the Black Templar sitting there right next to him, and um, he and this Black Templar picks up a glass of water, and it says in the novel gently raises it to his mouth for him to drink. It it it's like showing that this Black Templar is being very careful helping yeah. his mortal friend. Well, the Black Templars, in a lot of ways, are... I mean, we talk about the difference between Space Marines between 30k and 40k. The Black Templars do an exceptional job of... I want to say summarizing how Space Marines are 10,000 years later. They are so overwhelmingly not human whilst being human because of the very nature of where their honor comes from. And that just encompasses that completely. But I, I... I can't... One of the things I've written down for this episode is uh, on off the back of the Black Templars is the Crimson Fist. And it's a small little thing. A small little thing that not a lot of people know. I actually found about it in a tiny little paragraph from a White Dwarf magazine from about 20 years ago. Oh, I know what you're going to say. I know. Yeah, I know you know. The Crimson Fist. You know the Emperor's Champion? Yes, sir. The Crimson Fist actually fielded not a chapter champion but an Emperor's Champion, just like the Black Templars did. And there's wow. something about this um, this shared uh, honorable lime- lineage that the Imperial Fists share with their successors, the Black Templars, the Crimson Fists, etc., that I find so fucking awesome, you know? Well, well I mean, Alexis worlds. Pollux and Sigismund were the two most important Imperial yeah. Fist captains. They were some of the most important imp- important Space Marines ever. Yeah, uh, in my opinion, I thought I thought you were going to talk about the the Crimson Fist scene where uh, the Crimson Fist, led by the Chat Master Pedro Cantor, yeah, was escorting some civilians to a safe <gasps> oh, space. Yeah, and then a mother collapsed when she's holding her child, and Pedro Cantor walks up to her and she says like I'm like I'm getting tired, Lord, or something. And in the in the in the book, it, it comments on how his bolter is dangerously close to her head. For some reason, but instead of him shooting her, he she, he just goes, "You've done well enough carrying your child up to this point." And then he picks her up and the child, <laughs> and they sprint the rest of the way. Oh, Pedro Cantor, I love him. He's got. I, I, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it, gentlemen. He's got daddy vibes. He does. <laughs> he has daddy vibes. He does. Yeah, Crimson Fists used to be the old poster boys, and yes. they were like genuinely some of the most nice Marines out there. Not like yeah. the Salamanders, where it's overbranded, but just what they're doing and what they're willing to do for the sake of the people that they protect. Yeah, they just can. the most human. Yeah. Go on, Alex. Give us another successor. All right. So I think that the next one we should look at, and I think a lot of the audience is waiting for this one. Because if you talk about successor chapters, there's one that kind of pops up into everybody's mind, which yeah. is the space sharks. Like, oh fuck yeah. Let's be real. The space sharks are by far the most loved chapter around. I think there's the most fan art around it, like for almost yeah. any chapter. 
Of They're, course, the, they have Ty, Tyberos. <laughs> the big man. You don't see Tyberos the Red Wake. <laughs> you do not see Tyberos the Red Wake. The, the Roots did that for us, actually. He did, yeah. I'll put that on the screen, too. Uh, he did that ages ago. That's Tyberos the Red Wake, the stealthiest bus ever made. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's talk, actually, about this guy. This man is around, like, 12 feet tall. He is, like, half a body bigger than an average Marine. Plus then the fact that he, he doesn't fit normal Terminator armor. And Terminator armor, in the lore, we do know there are sizes up, there are sizes yeah. down. And we have massive suits. Uh, Alexis Pollux, which is also a massive Marine, yep. he fits in normal, like, Mark II power armor. Well, <laughs> Tyberos doesn't. He yeah. needs Dreadnought armor to upgrade his Terminator armor to fit. I'm waiting for the, you said 12 feet a minute ago, I'm waiting for the comment. I'm seeing it, I can envision it right now, the actually... Actually, oh, yeah. I'm gonna get blasted for that. <laughs> of course you are. But he's Liam huge. actually will counterpoint to that. Shut up, it's fun. <laughs> Tybros is awesome. The bigger, the better. It's that simple. I mean, look, look at this art. This is the most. This is fan art, but this is the most canon art of Ty, uh, Tyber. Oh, Tybros is this the have. one of the, the little, the little yellow, the little lamenter in front of him, just shitting? It's a, hands. it's a mantis warrior. I love how he's missing an arm, and uh, Tybros is just yeah. like, okay, we're fighting with one arm. Then. You know what's really nice about that piece? The the marine is missing an arm. He has one of his claws turned off. Yeah, he is balancing yeah. out to fight. He's making it a fair fight. In quotation marks. <laughs> plus, plus the plus the idea that that he never speaks below a low whisper, oh. and he's just so like silent and deadly despite him being fucking massive. Yeah, yeah. It's also just the the space sharks themselves are just super cool. Like the whole idea of them, they are technically a crusading chapter, just prowling around in the void, jumping on unsuspecting prey, jumping on just maybe elder ships or even orc ships and things that are just floating around around the edges. They jump on there, instantly destroy anyone. And then when they want new recruits, they do a thing called the Red Tide. Yeah. Which is where they go to a planet and kind of just slaughterhouse steal everyone that they need. It's from terrifying. prisons, mainly. It's, it's from, from prisons. prisons. Yeah, it is the, terrifying. This, the Space Sharks are another successor chapter that you think are overwhelmingly brutal in every aspect, but no... <laughs> when they showed up to the Bedab Wars, they didn't get invited. They just showed up. And then they <laughs> bent over backwards for the I Inquisition to let them fight. Like, they're like, okay, we're here to help. Here is gene seed for you to test. Here is our history for you to see. Here is whatever you need to show that we're loyal. Let's go. Let me go kill the motherfuckers that are down they just, there. They just wanted in on killing other Space Marines, man. They just <laughs> wanted it, bro. And then there was another. There was another one where the Carcharodon showed up to a, an Imperial world that was under siege by world leaders. Out of the blue, they just showed up. They butchered everyone in sight, and then the Imperial governor went to go talk to a Carcharodon captain, and it said that the Carcharodon captain asked politely but firmly that they're going to take supplies, and then a crusade <laughs> force will be here to help them out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and then they left. You know, don't want to picture that. That's just so f fucking heavy. You know. <laughs> just you're giving you're going to give us the supplies we need please and i hope he was wearing his brown pants man <laughs> <laughs> oh they're, they're just a... so cool like and also just their style the fact that they have like the maori paintings the yeah. old tribal paintings on their armor combined with using something we don't really see much in the 40k setting especially in aliens and things like more fishy parts yeah it's, it's a really nice contrast to the rest of the successor chapters. And their color it, scheme is awesome. It's really interesting that you say that because an awful lot of successor chapters, and uh, not just successors, but homebrews as well, will pick a culture or a vibe and abuse the fuck out of it to make it work for their chapter. But no one has captured that Maori influence quite like the, the, the space sharks have. You know, it, almost to the point where it's taboo to even try to have your successor or homebrew successor even influenced by Maori culture just yeah. because you can never even hold a candle to the aesthetics that are put forward by the space sharks. I'm going to say something that's probably going to make someone angry. There is a theory that the space sharks are in fact a night lord's uh, <laughs> rent, uh, like uh, Tim, no, tell us about the theory. It's actually really interesting because you told me about this a few weeks ago. Okay, so this goes back... So I'm a night lord man doing what a night lord can... Um, <laughs> when Conrad Kurz died, he was wearing something called the Crown of Night, 
and it had a gem inset in it. And previously the gem was said to be red, but when Conrad Kurz died, some other bit of lore said it was green. And Eldari soul stones do that, to where they change color from red to green uh, when a soul is inside of them. So the idea is that Conrad Kurz's soul got put into the crown when he died. And mm. uh, further point, like somehow someone found the gem and implanted it into a body of a marine, which caused this mutated growth of a gigantic marine that looks fucked up like Tyberos. Oh. And so the theory goes in, lends into, because Tyberos is so big and he's very brutal and he leads a chapter very brutally. Uh, and his preferred weapon is Power Claws, of course. And he's yep. just a vicious bastard to fight against. That somehow Tyberos is a resurrected Conrad Kurz, cured of his insanity. Uh, and he's trying to do what he can for the Imperium. And that's and he found some type of Raven, the Raven Guard successor that was supposed to be the the original Space Sharks. Yeah. And he imp, and he also integrated Night Lords into them as well. And so that's how they get this idea that there's Night Lord and Raven Guard gene seed inside of them, and that Tybros is actually resurrected Conrad Kurz, which is why he's so fucking big. Well, just as a personal anecdote to support that, if you've read anything about the Badab Wars and how the Space Sharks slash Katarodons orchestrated themselves during the Badab Wars. It, that shit is freakishly Night Lordish, <laughs> like scarily so. Uh, it holds a lot of credence. I think it's a little bit far fetched, my guy. I mean, to be fair, but as far as there's also, go, I'm in. To to be fair, on Nostromo, there was a huge emphasis on sea life, especially sharks. Huh. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, in the Conrad Kurz novel, when it goes back to the Nostromo and all the politicians, there was always, like, murals of sea life. And people always, in other Night Lords, always comment on, like, visiting the Black Sea to see the ghost sharks. Oh, oh. fuck. Well, now that I'm here, and as a, as represented as a world eater, I think yep. we should talk about the one chapter that is rumored... Maybe a slight tinge of World Eater in there. And there's a Loyalist successor chapter right now. Hmm. I want to talk about the Minotaurs. Oh, that's really funny, because I've heard an awful lot about the Minotaurs. There is the, yeah, I've there's heard a an awful huge lot about them being, being traitors, but not World Eaters. Please explain. Yeah, there is a huge discussion about that. Um... So I've made in total three videos on Minotaurs, and in yeah. every single one there is about a thirty percent divide between Iron Warriors, uh, World Eaters, and then whatever like remains. Yeah. Um, I personally am more of the belief of a World Eater because is in a it lot of their because you're a bit tactics, of a World Eater guy, possibly. Of, if I'm you're, slightly if you're biased. watching this right now and you're not just listening to this, you can see that Alex's avatar is in fact a World Eater. <laughs> I love Angron. So, <laughs> <laughs> the main reason I say that is they're not really world eaters. They yeah. are warhounds. Oh, the warhounds prior to the finding of Angron. The, uh, yeah. So, for anyone who knows, the, the warhounds were the world eaters legion prior to Angron being found. These white and blue space marines that had their own culture. It wasn't it like something like eight world eaters, sorry, eight warhound captains were fucking annihilated by Angron upon his family. Yeah, seven of them were murdered, and then the eighth one did the job, of course, because funny number. That Karn. Um, Karn. <laughs> yeah, Karn was the eighth captain to deal it. So for the Minotaurs, the main reason I think they might be Warhounds is because in a lot of their tactics that are described throughout the books, and especially, I have personally read the book Betrayer around 10 times. I freaking Holy love that book. Shit. I love that Aaron Dembski Brown, and I love that book so much. You've read that book more than I've watched Shrek. That's impressive. <laughs> so within that book, there is a lot of talk about what they used to be before yeah. they met Angron. We see Angron in his character, but we also see how that really kind of like jumps against their character. And for me, a lot of the um, their tactics, the way they communicate, not the culture though, because the Minotaurs are very much Spartans and the Warhounds weren't. Yeah. Um, in a lot of their tactics. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But the thing is, is they also, they don't fight enough in those tactics. They fight more as packs running in, especially described in the Battle War. They're more just a random army running in, slaughtering everything. Look what they did to, I think, the Lamenters. 
Yeah, well, people forget that it, the the Iron Warriors have that Greek vibe, and the Ultramarines have that Roman vibe, but we forget that the World Eaters were inspired by the Gladiator vibe, which often is a mix of both of those two things. Yeah. And that's where, for me, it's kind of, like, puts the edge in my head. They might be Iron Warriors, they might be World Eaters. Yeah. We'll probably never find out. But what I do really like about them is that their um, chapter master, Asterion Moloch, was able to scare the shit out of Custodes. Oh, did you watch the, uh, the, uh, the Minotaur short we put out? a few days ago well it'll be, like, it be like four weeks ago from the time this goes live but I one did, of the things yeah. i mentioned was was from i can't remember which book it was so that's gonna beat me up <laughs> about how a my uh, about how asterion malok on the steps of some fucking part of the palace of terror essentially confronted a custodian or a group of custodians and that custodian had his inner monologue how he had defeated opponents he thought outmatched him and he stared Asterion Malok down and looked at this man and thought, I don't think I can win this, or I don't know if I can win this. And all you've got is just this silent man who exhumes this aura of death. And if a custodian looks at you and says, you exhume an aura of death, that's, yeah. that's like, unfucking paralleled, you know? There is so much, and then like the fact, like he has black eye lenses. Most Marines have flowing yeah. eye lenses. He has black eye lenses. You yeah. look into it, and you only see the void of death. Yeah, there's such a cool vibe. I oh, I just man. love the way the Minotaurs look as well. Um, their Fortral models were absolutely amazing. The Chapel yeah. model as well. It's so cool. That's the nice thing about the Starion Moloch. He never went to a meeting himself. He would also he would only ever send out his chaplain to talk to people. Yeah. He, because he was just too dangerous. <laughs> well, he was the. Uh, it's crazy because in the in one of the videos we're putting out for the the channel in the next few sort of days or weeks, one of the things that you can do with chapter masters, you kind of got two approaches. You can have a man who is very upfront with representing the chapter, or you can have a man who is essentially the silent hand. And there is no chapter master who is the embodiment of the silent hand more than Malok. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I freaking love them. And Spartan vibes always looks great. Yeah. There is some amazing art pieces for them. And especially, like, a lot of the fan art for them is awesome. Their color scheme, just the bronze with a little bit of, like, the coppery tinge in it. Yeah. With a little bit of the greenish rust in the edges. It's also such a fun scheme to paint. Absolutely, fucking lootly, yeah. Uh, sorry, gentlemen. Can we bring this to a close? Absolutely. I'm going to cut this a bit out. Right. Holy fuck. I'll tell you what though, man. I, I really do fucking love the Minotaurs. It's funny because you look at their paint scheme and it's one of the ones with lots of heavy, very heavy on the metallics and the reds and the golds, uh, the bronzes and the golds and the reds. I, I, I really wish I had had the willpower to decide to paint at some point. It's I could very easily have seen another timeline where I wasn't so into the Sons of Medusa and had down the Minotaurs instead. Some some really fucking insane... And I'll put them on the screen now. There's some really insane kit bashes floating about there for Asterion Malok. Just like there's some really insane kit bashes floating out there for uh, Tyros the Red Wake. You know? I honestly yeah. think that's... Uh, I think that's one of the most special things about these successor chapters that we made. Just like Valen Carl of the, the Sons of Medusa... I don't know if the Exorcists, like we spoke about uh, 30 minutes ago, I don't know if they have any, like, really special There's characters. Not really. There's not much lore on their special characters. Besides, maybe, like, their chapter master who expelled a greater demon himself, there is, like, some pages on that. And I'm sure there are some great conversions of that out there. But that's really, in my opinion, that's really the test of a chapter, whether the chapter's vibe can persist without the presence of a named chapter master, you know? Like the like the exorcists are able to pull off, and that's really fucking impressive. Yeah. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to a close of this episode. Alex, it has been fucking amazing uh, it's to have you great. on to to get to know you and speak to you. Uh, I personally, and I'm sure it's the same for Red and the others as well. We wish you nothing but the utmost uh, success in your channel. If you're watching this, go to YouTube, type in the Gaming Storyteller or the Dutch 40k guy, and you'll find Alex's works. Uh, he creates some of, if not the most incredible 40k lore shorts uh, on, the, on the platform. 
please have a look. Send that subscribe button. Uh, yeah, it's been it's, an absolute fucking treat to have you, Alex. Thanks. Yeah, it was really great. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to hear about your imminent demise that's going to happen right after we turn this off. Because uh, I can't let you live any further. Really have to thin out the competition, you know. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's just how it is. Abdominus Knox. Good night. Hi there. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider liking and subscribing, and maybe hitting the bell icon to be notified of future content. You can get in touch with myself and the other members of the team by joining our Discord or other social medias, all linked below. Thanks for watching. 